and gave me some movie film. He stayed for a few days. Alas, some years later he stopped writing and all attempts to find him have failed. Aircraft prepared and bombed up, briefing completed, and on a clear night, several score four-engine British bombers took off for Germany, headed for the 58th attack on the twin towns of Mannheim Ludwigshafen, the second largest inland port in Europe, with miles of docks and widespread industrial installations, making machinery and electrical plant producing vast quantities of chemicals, a vital cog in the German war machine. First, let's learn something about the target. Here is a map of Europe showing Germany in black. Note the position of Mannheim relative to Berlin, Frankfurt and Cologne. Let's take a closer look at the area. You'll see that Mannheim and Ludwigshafen make up a compact built-up area, intercepted by a number of important and distinctive waterways connecting with the rivers Rhine and Neckar. Note the Ludwigshafen port area, the Mannheim docks on the east bank of the Rhine, and the important bridge linking Mannheim and Ludwigshafen, and these other targets destined for bombing. Here, marked by a black line, is the path of the aircraft which is carrying the film cameras. Remember this map. Now we start the run-up. Already target indicators dropped by the Pathfinder force are cascading down to mark the target for the main force of bombers. The attack now starts to build up. Take a look at this early stage of the attack while we stop the film during the split second when the scene is lit by the photo flashes dropped by other aircraft. Remember the map. The arrows indicate hits right on the targets. Watch the parachute flares to the left of the screen slowly drifting across the target areas. Now the whole area is well covered with incendiaries, feeding the fires already started by the heavy high explosive bombs. There in top centre is a 4,000 pound bomb falling. Now we leave behind the flaming battlefield of yet another victory of Bomber Command. At the beginning of 1943, Jeff Ware was a pilot on Stirlings, his navigator, Brian Harris. Together they completed a tour with number 15 squadron at Bourne in Cambridgeshire. As you know, Jeff, our Stirling was D for dog. Our squadron was 15. The code was LS. So the markings on one side of our plane were LSD, which before decimalization stood for pounds, shillings and pence. But as sergeants, our pay was 13 shillings and sixpence, or approximately 70 pence a day. Remember the squadron mascot? A bulldog called Bill. We thought he should pose for us in a crew photograph with sterling D-dog behind us. He was familiar with the skies over Germany, having flown several missions. Sadly, he was run over by a lorry, but had his write-up and picture in the press. He certainly had his share of good luck. So did we, Jeff. Remember the night we attacked Kiel? We were often hit by flak, but unless someone or something vital was hit, we tended to ignore it, as we did on this occasion until Jimmy Naylor, our engineer, informed you we were short of fuel. I started to calculate the shortest way back to base, ignoring the official route. We were lucky and somehow made it. The next morning, as we approached D-Dog, she seemed to be having more attention than usual. We were shown holes in the wings made by ACAC shells, fused to explode at the height of the Lancasters and Halifaxes, several thousand feet above us. Now we knew where Jimmy's fuel had gone. Starboard tanks three and four had been ripped open. This repair was needed after a piece of shrapnel buried itself in the fuselage. 
a few feet from my legs. I think you still have that souvenir, Jeff. I expect you will recall, Brian, our trip to Berlin on the 29th of March, 1943. My logbook confirms that there was no trouble except icing. To make sense of what happened, I have to say that I had developed a way of landing a sterling, which I can only describe now as flying down the approach and effectively high speed stalling the aircraft onto the ground. The enormous flaps killed the excess speed, so we remained on the ground. After this particular raid, I was unaware that not all our bombs had dropped on the target due to icing of the bomb release gear. This was not dangerous in itself, but it had an unwanted effect on the aircraft. When I pulled back on the control column to land, the additional weight of the bombs provided greater inertia, and the aircraft continued to fly and to climb, but lost speed. The port wing dropped, and at that moment an almighty crash was imminent. But the good old Sterling responded to hard opposite rudder, and a quick burst on the port engines. We landed rather bumpily but safely on the grass, parallel to the runway. There were two postscripts to this. One was that control told me that the starboard wing light looked as if it was directly over the port wing light. And two was my time from permission to land to the time I called clear of the runway was 17 seconds. An unwanted record, no doubt you will agree. Targets which must be attacked and destroyed before the Allied armies can set foot in Western Europe are scattered over a vast area and affect the whole Nazi military machine. Defences of every kind, special anti-invasion weapons, big coastal batteries, gun sites and shore defences, e-boat pens and hideouts, railway centres, engine repair shops and rolling stock. Industry of every kind which helps to arm the German forces. These are the targets which are being destroyed so as to paralyze any efforts which Hitler may make to stem our invading forces. And so all day and all night, aircraft of the Allied Air Forces are in the air, carrying out this vital work. Meanwhile, across southern England, there was a huge build-up of supplies, together with massive British and American troop concentrations. By now, it was impossible to conceal from the Germans that an invasion of northwest France would indeed take place in the summer of 1944. Joining the invasion forces were aircraft of every description, including Sterling's towing airborne troops to vital dropping zones. The big dilemma for the Germans was where or when, so to add to their problems, the Allied planners devised a variety of deceptions. Taking a vital part in one of these was Flight Lieutenant Ron College, a navigator with number 218 Squadron. I'd completed 32 bombing missions, mainly over Germany, when some weeks before the invasion, uh, senior crews from our squadron began practicing new techniques, which puzzled us at the time, uh, but became clear later on. We had a shrewd suspicion it had something to do with the invasion of Europe, especially as we'd been told not to discuss what we were doing with anyone not directly involved. At sometime before midnight on the 5th of June, six Sterlings took off from uh, Woolfox Lodge near Oakham in Rutland. Uh, instead of the usual one, each carried three navigators, one responsible for getting us to our operating area in the English Channel and hopefully back again. Uh, the second operated the G uh, set and as the third, my task was to use the new G8 set, which meant setting scores of turning point coordinates on whose accuracy de depended the success of the mission. No bombs were carried, uh, but instead many bundles of window, uh, now often called chaff. Um, extra aircrew were on board to drop the window at given signals and stop when ordered window was merely accurately cut strips of thin foil but would create the effect when detected on the German radar screens in such huge quantities of a vast armada approaching Cap Grenet. It was vital that a method should be devised
to get this spoof invasion fleet to advance toward the French coast at about five knots, the approximate speed of such a fleet when the aircraft were travelling at 180 knots. This diagram shows only one aircraft carrying out this ingenious manoeuvre, whereas we were flying in two groups of three, line abreast, one mile apart, and the second four miles behind the first. With such precision navigation and window being dropped only on the parallel legs, a rectangle of foil was thus created, moving menacingly across the channel. From reports, it worked very well, and it was some time the next morning before the Germans were satisfied there was no invasion fleet in sight. Uh, our operation, codenamed Glimmer, took place at a similar time to Operation Taxable, carried out by Lancaster's of 617 Dambuster Squadron towards Le Havre. Fortunately, all six aircraft returned safely, and after debriefing, we went to the mess for breakfast. After a normal night hop, we would then have snatched a few hours sleep, but sleep was farthest from our minds that morning, and eventually we heard the BBC announce and confirm what we really knew. The Allies had started the invasion of Europe. I think we then went to bed. And while they slept, the invasion armada was underway. Hundreds of ships, thousands of men, were on a very rough 100-mile sea crossing to Normandy. As everyone knows, the operation had been delayed 24 hours. The troops were trained to expect fierce battles ahead. It was vital that supplies of every kind were put ashore, and, just as important, was the continued dropping of food and arms to the Maquis. Number 620 Squadron had been carrying out this task for some time, as navigator Doug Simmons confirms. I recently finished reading a biography of Daphne du Maurier by Margaret Forster, a fascinating account of her unusual lifestyle. She was one of the foremost novelists of her day, with such well-known books as Rebecca, My Cousin Rachel and Jamaica Inn. However, much of the biography also describes her relationship with her husband, Lieutenant General Boy Browning, who in September 1944 was GOC of the Airborne Forces. My connection with General Browning arose on the 2nd of August 1944, when I was the navigator of the Stirling V for Victor of 620 Squadron, stationed at Fairford, Gloucestershire. At approximately 2300 on the day in question, we were still in dispersal with our engines running, waiting for the signal from control to move off. When a small truck drew up alongside, our skipper Ross Bunce was asked to put the steps down for another passenger. In no time at all, he was scrambled aboard and we were on our way. Our mysterious passenger was strapped into the co-pilot seat. Our operation on this particular night was one of the special air service operations whereby single aircraft would drop either one or two men or supplies to the resistance movement in France. Our passenger remained silent and unobtrusive for 15 or so minutes, after which he revealed to me that he was none other than Lieutenant General Browning. He was taking the trip with us to familiarize himself with the Stirling, which his airborne forces would be using the following month at Arnhem. Needless to say, we had no inkling of the forthcoming operation, nor did he give us any. Our trip was uneventful. Our job was to drop several tons of food and ammunition to the Mackey, some miles east of Paris. As navigator, it was my job to find the dropping zone, the technique being for the Mackey to hear our engines as we were flying at no more than 2,000 feet. There was, of course, an appointed time which had been signalled from London, and provided we were there within a few minutes, the resistance would light up a bonfire which gave us an aiming point to drop our load. These drops were normally carried out by experienced crews. Our pilot and bomb airman, Jack Farmer, needed a steady head. We landed back at base at 0230, having experienced nothing but occasional light flak and no night fighters. I remember during the flight, both I and my skipper 
were questioned in some detail by General Browning as to how we managed to find those dropping zones. It was, in fact, largely because of the marvelous G navigation equipment, which could see in the dark, not to mention a sweating navigator and bomb aimer, who hoped they'd got their target. The Marquis used to report back to London when a successful drop was completed, as indeed they did on the occasion in question. After the operation was completed and we were back in debriefing, General Browning did not have time to join...